We bout to party. Unrestricted. Got the house now. We gon' turn it up. Up, bring the house down. Got that big space pump and make them bounce now. Flossing like they bossing and the freaks are coming out now. AEW Unrestricted. Welcome in, folks. It's Aubrey Edwards. It's Will Washington. How are you doing, Aubrey? I'm doing great. How are you, Will? <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm glad you matched my energy on that. Right? Uh, kind of hard not no, to. I, I, th- look, we are in exciting times right now. We just came off a little bit over uh, almost two weeks ago on Forbidden Door, which Dude. was a phenomenal show. Dude. I, <laughs> I, I was so happy that you got to run in on that main event. Dude. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like i'm sitting in the back and catering and i see paul go down and i'm just god damn it (laughs) (laughs) trying to quickly make my way through the back all of a sudden like oh no don Callis is out there i really gotta hustle up and then i love when i get to the back and the first thing that somebody says to me is damn you're fast i'm like i wish i could have been faster sorry guys (laughs) yeah no literally when swerve starts motioning and then all of a sudden (gasps) you just get to make your patented sprint so great uh no honestly uh the energy for that particular match one of the things i like to do it's a little secret for those who don't know is once we start opening the doors i kind of like to chill in the go position area and i kind of like to start paying attention to uh it's kind of like people watching but not really people watching but i'm like people listening Mm. and i love listening to the things i'm hearing people say in the arena because little secret from the go position you can hear everything everything you can hear the crowd you can hear the roar you can hear it all and so i start listening and literally from the minute people start getting in the building you start hearing let's go osprey let's go swerve and i'm like that matches in six hours but okay (laughs) Um, but but literally from the moment people got in and so it was like they were all holding their energy in and i remember the moment the bell rang paul motions for the bell crowd goes nuts and they were with it from beginning to end and again to get to see you do that in the finish was was so cool and now we're on our way we are less than two weeks away from blood and guts oh, boy. uh nashville tennessee those tickets are still available aewtix.com blood and guts is always a a massacre in the best of ways oh brother it is the most stressful match type I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to go on record and say it is the most stressful match type that we have as a referee, because it's it's a lot. It's over an hour. It's multiple commercials. There's so many things going on uh, when someone gets hurt and the doors are locked and you can't get in. Like <laughs> There's so many unique situations that happen with blood and guts that just don't happen in any other scenario from both a wrestling and a TV perspective that I'm excited. But at the same time, I'm like, oh my God, it's already blood and guts time again. <laughs> Yep. Uh, And I'm excited for this. I'm excited for the teams. I'm excited for everything that we got going on here. But I'm also very much excited for this episode of AEW Unrestricted. Look, I I think Unrestricted, honestly, I've had so much fun doing some of the interviews we've gotten to do this year. But this particular show has one of my favorite people in AEW joining us today. Who have we got here, Aubrey? Oh my God, I'm so, so happy that she is here. The first woman, fun fact, to be ranked in the top 50 of the PWI 500, Afropunk, Trish Adora. How are you doing today, Trish? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. It's been a good week. I'm nice and settled out right now, so I'm feeling pretty good. You look so chill. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say real quick, shout out to uh, to my old co-host uh, from Grap City, PWI's own Righteous Reg, who fought for that one. Yes. And I remember that. I, I remember that at the time as that was happening. And yeah, because I believe, if I remember correctly, that same year, uh, Reg has the Black Wrestling's 500 and you were number one on that that year. Ooh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fighting the good fight. That's some good reporting right there. <laughs> Hell yeah. So so I have a question for, I think, pretty much for me and everyone, but could you go into a little bit about what Afropunk means, since that is such a, something that describes you? Like, tell us a little bit more about it. Yes. So for me, Afropunk is just a celebration of cultures, cultures that are true to me, passed down from my family. Like a lot of the things that I wear, a lot of the mannerisms that I have were directly passed down from my mother or handed down from my brothers and aunts and great aunts. So we really like to keep it in the family. So it's uh, true to that as well. So it's really just a celebration of the culture. It's a lightness. It's a levity to it. It's 
it's you're, you're still grounded, but there's just a lev- levity to your entire being. So I love that. Nice and light. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask about uh, how most recently fans have come to know you, which is as a part of the infantry yes. with Carly Bravo <laughs> and Sean Dean. Talk about how this team came together. Oh my gosh, it came together so naturally. It's so interesting because I was in the army. And Captain Sean Dean, he's in the Navy. Carly Bravo is in the Marines. So it's just the amalgamation. We just all work on how it happened. It's like one day we were just backstage together and it just clicked. It just clicked. We've been by each other's side for about a year and a half now, almost two years. So, Well, being around you guys, it, it feels like there's such a camaraderie with you. When I see the three of you backstage, it is always uh, it's such a joy to be around. Can you talk about the friendship with you guys? Yes. It's like, okay, so during the week, I'm here in Vegas. And, you know, it's like by the time I touch down where we're supposed to be for tapings, it's like we immediately, we have to find each other. We're like, all right, where are my people? Where are we at? We find each other immediately. And we literally don't stop laughing until it's time for us to go back to the airport and it's time for us to leave again, you know, and it's, you know, back to reality, so to speak. But, yeah, it's it's just such a time. Like, I stopped calling it like a home away from home, or like you know my family on the road, where it's starting to be my home, and they're starting to like be my family as we begin to like just spend more time together. They're such a hoot, and they bring out this side of me that I feel like maybe I was just a little too reserved or too shy to like maybe laugh as loud as I do now or talk about certain things that I do now. And it's really just them bringing that out of me. They're like brothers to me. They're, they're pretty good guys. So. I was going to say, it really does seem like brother sister type relationship. Cause I know like backstage, if I'm say like I'm with an inventory match or whatever, and we're about to go out there, you see Carly like, where is Trish? We got to find Trish. <laughs> it doesn't matter time. what we're doing or what the match is. Like his number one priority is making sure that his sister's nearby yes. <laughs> so that he can do what he needs to do. <laughs> so I 100% respect that. That's freaking great. I love it. Yeah. You guys all together just have this amazing chemistry And it's very clear that you guys have this really strong friendship. I actually didn't know you were in the military until right before this. You served eight years in the United States Army as a signal support specialist and military police officer in Afghanistan, which is like, cool, mic drop. Let me just tell you how (laughs) badass I am. Could you explain (laughs) like what all of that is? Because to me, it's just like U.S. badass is is what your title should be. But please go into more detail. Those job descriptions, the signal support is generally like a radio tech. So it would be like I would uh, travel each week and maybe put up light poles or make sure our comms were situated, make sure just pretty much like any backstage things like that. So that's what I would be. I was trying to compare it more to like what we have now with uh, with the people that we have backstage and production and things like that. So I'd be responsible for that transport of all those things putting them up, taking them down, making sure they work, any type of communications for any traveling that we do with like any unmanned aerial systems that would fly to and fro for comms, things like that. So it's a a pretty complicated deal, (laughs) essentially, just um, a radio tech, I'd say that, generally speaking. And a military police officer is just that, (laughs) law and order, but overseas. Being local would mean that I would do like riot control, things like that. If there was, I was local to Washington, D.C., so there was a lot of security duties and stuff like that, security forces, things like that. And to deploy would be the same thing. Definitely higher stakes for those types of missions. So <laughs> so generally speaking, those things are what I was in charge of. Uh, well, talk a little bit about the decision to to join the Army. Um, you know, you've uh, you've mentioned before how you owe a lot to your mom and she's always supported you and encouraged you into wrestling. What was the reaction like family wise when you decided to join the army? Yeah. So that was, that was, that was interesting because, uh, <laughs> it's a bit of a story. So, okay, really quick. So I was waiting tables at the time <laughs> and someone I worked with random, so completely random. And I'm 18 at the time. He's like, uh, Hey, do you want to join the army? I'm like, what are you talking about? I did not know. I'm just, just on a whim. It, it was so random and so on a whim. He said that he'd been talking to like a recruiter for a couple of weeks. And I'm like, whatever. I completely bypassed everything he said. And then like, he would ask like ever so often. And three months later, he's like, hey, I'm going to sign up. And he was about to leave. 
And so he's talking to me about like all the benefits and like stuff like that. And I was like, shoot, that's, and I just, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was kind of stuck. And so I was like, all right, fine. One phone call. That's it. If I would need a lot, right. I'd have to be pretty talked into it, so to speak. So I'm like, all right, one phone call after that, I'm not going to hear it anymore. I'll go back to waiting tables. And, uh, yeah, that one phone call was all it took. They explained to me like, uh, the freedom, like all the benefits and, you know, put a pretty little bow on it, didn't they? You know, and that's their job as recruiters. That's, uh, (laughs) they're, they're the best at that for a reason. So yeah, I signed up, I signed all my paperwork and then I told my family, which, uh, yeah, that didn't go over so well. My mom did not like that at all. It was about like a month before she was like talking to me again. She was so, she was not thrilled that I did that. I definitely, it, it was kind of on a whim. I definitely didn't show any signs of wanting to do something like that. I just, something in me just kind of shifted during those conversations and it just, a, a turn for the best, honestly. I'm really, really happy that I did that. It changed the trajectory, I think, of who I'm supposed to be as a person. You know, I feel like there's something threaded in me now that's really never going to go away. You know, I thought like after all this time, like there'd be something I forget or something I just don't have that instinct anymore. And I still do. I owe a lot to the army for that. I was going to say, it feels like, and, and maybe it's just because it's something that I've always known about you, that it feels like it's such a part of your identity and who you are, <laughs> that to think that there was ever a time that there's a Trisha Dora that didn't have a military background, like doesn't even compute in my head, right? And so yeah. uh, just thinking about how it just kind of happened on a whim and to think about how that essentially one conversation basically change the trajectory of who you are and how people view you going forward. That's crazy. That's crazy. I could have never, I could have never thought that I would be doing something like that for as long as I have too. And, um, just, you know, still having like a lot of friends that are in the military as well, still just really attaching myself to that family and like having that camaraderie. I I couldn't replace it with anything. It's so, it's so crazy. So I'm happy to have that. Awesome. I have so many more questions, but we got to take a real quick break. This is the AW Unrestricted. Will and Aubrey will be right back after these messages. Unrestricted, Aubrey, Will, talking with Trisha Dora here on the podcast, just talking a little bit about kind of your military background going into it. And I think Will had a really good point about how it's such a huge part of who you are now which is really interesting because before the podcast, you and I were talking about just kind of like long-term plans and how it doesn't make sense to really come up with anything longer than like three years out because who knows where life is going to take you, right? So So that begs the question, how do you go from being in the army for eight years to being a professional wrestler? (laughs) You know, the transition was very, very interesting. I'll tell you what. Please tell me more. Yeah, just the schedule, the scheduling differences, just... In the military, everything is planned for you. There are very few things that I had to think about. I didn't even have to think about what to wear, you know what I mean? So a lot was decided for me, especially in independent wrestling. It's all up to you. So it was almost like a little bit of whiplash. I go from not having any wiggle room in anything that I say or do or and being able to present as like exactly who I want to be. It was a lot of whiplash. But once I got my bearings, I was like, Oh, this is neat. <laughs> you know, just being able to decide what, how I want to present, what I'd like to wear, how I like to, what I'd want to be called. It's just, it's pretty interesting. Like being, being in charge and feeling that fully. The schedule and the training is something that is just a lot different. Especially I trained at uh, Team Fruity, uh, initially in Florida with, uh, Bubba Ray and Devon Dudley. That took me through my paces for sure. And it was probably, Honestly, I'll tell you what, it's one of the closest training regiments to my actual military service. So um, it was nice to definitely have that level of like mental discipline to prepare you for the journey of pro wrestling, you know. And even now, like I just didn't think it would be like this, you know, (laughs) and the training prepared me to be adaptable. All of my training that I've ever had in my entire life has always trained me that you have to be adaptable. You know, the changes are going to happen at every point in life. With every season, something new happens. My mindset shifts. So maybe, maybe I look differently. Maybe I'm looking at things differently. 
So with everything shifting, it's just important to have some adaptability. That stays the same thing. <laughs> I want to get into training with uh, Team 3D and talking about exactly what guided you there uh, at beyond you know, there's so many options in the wrestling world that that specific one, you know, obviously caught your eye. Uh, what about that school caught your eye and, and what brought you to uh, Devon and Bubba? That's so interesting. Yeah, it's it's such a, a funny story. It was a bit on a whim as well. So I'm from Washington, D.C., and I was trying to just look at some of the best schools in the country. At that point, I knew that I was exiting the military, so I had a little bit of money saved up. And it was just going to go to the big move and everything that I had to do. I was actually going to go to a different school. And I went down to Florida. I drove down to Florida uh, in a rental car and about $3,000. <laughs> so, as you know, that went quickly. But um, I drove down to Florida without a plan. I planned to go somewhere else. I went to visit there and the school cost $2,000. And I was like, no, <laughs> shoot. So I'd like, freaked out a little bit. So I was derailed. I had to get a place really quick and I got a job. You know, when you first start a job, they do this thing where they make everybody stand up and give some fun facts about yourself and all that stuff. And I was like, all right, cool. So somebody stood up and she's like, I'm a pro wrestler. You know, I'm trying to be a pro wrestler. I'm like, who is this girl? And so I was like, okay, whatever. My turn goes. I say my stuff, whatever. The meeting's done. I make a beeline. Like, hey, what's up? What are you training at? What, how, what are you doing? And she's like, oh, I'm at Team 3D. And I was like, wait, what? And I don't know how it slipped past me, but in all my research, I just didn't catch that they had a school. And I went to visit with her that next week. And the rest was history. So it was not a whim. Like if I didn't get that job, if I didn't go that day, if she decided to share another fact about herself, if I just knew that and didn't, because the part really was me walking up to her being like, hey, just putting myself out there in that way. So there's just a lot to it. And the fact that it actually like went all the way through to me actually starting a train there. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> Your your whole life is just like happy accidents of running into the right people and them suggesting wonderful things that just change your life. If you could find a way to like bottle and sell that luck, I think you'd be a millionaire. <laughs> I never one time thought of it like that. That is so you not? It is like literally the two major moments of your life for someone else going, hey, yeah. what about this thing? <laughs> And it was a fourth of the price too, so I could I started Perfect. immediately because I was able to afford it immediately. I couldn't even believe it, but yeah, <laughs> that's that's how that all came to be. It's kind of crazy. Damn. Well, talking about kind of the uh, the stroke of luck, and a lot of people wouldn't consider it luck unless you're a professional wrestler. <laughs> you know, you had gotten started in the indies, and you were kind of making a bit of a run, but it really wasn't until I felt like the pandemic that fans really started to discover who you were in that same way where the rest of the world kind of suffered for it. Professional wrestlers really got to shine and really got to, to get out there and make names for themselves. And that was really where I discovered your work was during the pandemic. So I wanted to kind of talk about um, how that ended up being almost a bit of a blessing for you in the sense of some of the exposure you got during that time. Yeah, it's it's so crazy how that happened. I think uh, at that point, I was just too scared to take a break. The stability of what wrestling really was is, was on full display. I just, I got nervous and I kind of tapped into my resources. I started to make the trips again. I started to make the calls again. I don't know. I don't like bring this. I even like lowered my rate for like a little while just to kind of like make sure I could keep myself working. Um, if anybody was still training, I made sure to tap in big with people that were training, like um, at the Worldwide Dojo in Pennsylvania with Cheeseburger. He's awesome. And being able to like tap in no matter where I was going, um, having a ring to work in, having good working relationships. Like it was just, it was such a huge test. And it showed me that it was important for me to like just tap into those resources and not being afraid to put myself out there. Everything stopped, but not everything. Mm -hmm. There were still, you know, a few shows going on. There was still a way to like make it work for you. There were other things to tap into. A lot of people got into streaming or just increasing their social media presence. A lot of, I mean, and honestly, a lot of people stopped wrestling and never came back. A lot of companies stopped running shows and they never came back. And I just, 
I don't know. I just didn't want that to be me. And I wanted to make sure that I was always just, I was always there. You have such an amazing like hustler attitude. It makes so much sense why you've come as far as you have in wrestling in such a short amount of time. It's like, oh yeah, no, you, you get it. You understand the game of it. It's one thing to be talented, but it's another thing to send out those messages, cutting your rate where you need to, because you want the exposure. And that happens to be the thing that's more, you know, important at any given time. And just making the phone calls, knowing you're going to get no a lot, but like trying to put yourself out there. Like it's incredibly impressive. And I think a lot of people don't realize like that's a huge, huge key to success in wrestling. And the fact that you went from a culture that's very much tells you exactly what to wear and when to wake up and what to eat every day to you're on your own and you're doing your own drive. That's incredible. I'm so freaking impressed, girl. That's freaking awesome. <laughs> yes, yes. Honestly, I owe a lot of that uh, to Beyond Wrestling. My goodness, like they, they put on such, they were able to just adapt and adapt and adapt and adapt and adapt and change the model a bit and adapt and, you know, rewrite sometimes the way we look at indie wrestling as a whole. They kept it alive for a lot of us. So big ups to them. They were really they're even like doing training now. So I'm just so impressed with how they've been able to adapt. And that's been my home during the pandemic. So I'm very, very thankful for that. Those drives, those DC to Worcester drives were rough and I made them all the time and I was happy to do it for them. So sorry, just wanted to shout them out really quick. Oh no, we got to shout out the people that help us get to where we are, especially beyond wrestling. They're such good guys like Drew and all of them. Freaking incredible. Yes. Well, one of the things I I wanted to talk about was also during that period, as Ring of Honor was starting to to get itself going in the pandemic, that was really where you also started to get exposed to a lot of the wider wrestling audience. And you had actually signed with Ring of Honor um, in late 2021. Talk to me a little bit about that period and why you chose to sign with Ring of Honor at that point. You know, at that point, I was really starting to like make my cases and it felt like the right time. It's like everything happened at the right time. It was being offered to me and it was being presented to me in a way that I felt that I could shine my best. They had an amazing women's division and they still do, of course. And just being a part of that, being a woman of honor, just, it's a nice little chip on the shoulder. You know, it's like a nice little feather in my cap, I should say. Just being a part of that. And I also trained at the Ring of Honor Dojo as well. And being a part of like, the last group to like cycle through the uh, Baltimore dojo. It was just to wear that jacket now and to wear those shirts now. It feels like I just feel like such an elevated athlete and performer. I'm so thankful to Ring of Honor. I'm happy to represent Ring of Honor wherever I go. Anytime somebody asks, I got big love for Ring of Honor. You know, I speak so highly of them. They gave me my first chance at a time where like, too, I was having a little bit of having a bit of imposter syndrome, I'll be honest, and just putting me in a good position and uh, just making sure I was surrounded by good people and had amazing people to wrestle. That's that's all I could ask for, honestly. We know how it went. End of 2021, Ring of Honor unfortunately shuts down. Everyone's out of work. Eventually, you find your way into AEW, and now you're performing with Ring of Honor again. Like, how, How does that feel? So that feels really, really good. It's like a nice full circle moment, you know? I think too, my mindset has shifted. I think about things a little bit differently. I have different goals actually than I had in 2021. Things are so different for me, like mentally and what I want for my career that it's happening this way and at this time and I'm being afforded with so many amazing opportunities. And now it it, it feels, it's like a cherry on top. It feels perfect now. And I'm happy to be reafforded with these opportunities. They do not come around often. I've had to say goodbye to so many little things and I'm like, ah, shoot. And uh, they never come around again. So for this to come around again, it feels amazing. And it's just not lost on me what I'm able to do every week. So happy to do that. So I want to talk about how that opportunity kind of came to be. You had your first dark match in AEW in November of 2021. You had faced Riho. That was, again, you know, you had kind of accumulated so much buzz on the indies that I remember when the announcement hit, it was, it wasn't even an announcement. It was the the spoiler online, the people who had been in the arena and they had tweeted, oh my God, Trisha Dora just 
had a match on AEW Dark and she just faced Riho and there was all this excitement around that. And again, h- how did that moment end up coming to be? I I, I've, I wanted to know this because I, I have a feeling I know the story, but for the rest for the rest of the audience, uh, please let them know. Around uh, a few, actually earlier that year, my mom passed away. And so there were a few appearances that I wanted to do and they just, they hadn't worked out. So there was a lot of like stop and start and then a lot of the imposter syndrome. So there was a lot of emotional things that was hap- that were happening that year that prevented me from really like showing up as my full self. So having that match just be like a nice start to like the flow of everything, it felt really, really good. And being able to like share that with Riho and she's awesome. I swear, I could I could form Incredible. her every day of the week. Oh, I yeah. tell you what, I'd love to do that. But <laughs> but yeah, it was like such a cool moment. Everybody like in my circle was like so excited. It felt like a nice light at the end of the tunnel. That okay, that I can still like break through and have such a cool moment. It can still happen for me. So it was a nice reaffirmation and whatnot. And then you got to wrestle Riho again on TV. And so like for that to yes. come back around uh, is yes. also really cool. Yes, we doubled back to that. Oh. Yeah, do you guys have like incredible chemistry? Like uh, thinking about the the size difference between you two and how you guys are able to work that into your matches. I always think that it's so much fun to watch when I see you and Riho in the ring. For it to go from being a match we did on Dark to then getting to be something we did on Rampage in in front of the the TV audience and then getting to really get to experience what you bring to the table, but not just that, but how you two work size into each other, the way she does the bridge out of the pen, like everything about that. It's always just so much fun with you two together in the ring. Yes. She's one of my favorite opponents. I'd, I'd love to wrestle her again and again and again. She's awesome. She's very, very awesome. She's really cool. So are you. So is this conversation. We've got more coming up here on AEW Unrestricted. <laughs> AEW Unrestricted, it's Aubrey and Will, and we're talking with the one and only Trisha Dora. Trish, I want to ask you about a particular championship that you put on the map. A title that has only had two holders at this point, but uh, it was one that I think, again, through the pandemic, uh, you won it just before the pandemic. And you got to hold it all the way through. And it really became synonymous with your identity, I feel like. That was the Pan-African Diaspora Wrestling World Champion at Fight Club. Let's talk about that. So Fight Club is, I would consider it my home promotion. And a funny story, actually, how the promotion came to be. So in 2012, I deployed to Afghanistan with my unit. And there was another person in my unit who we kind of bonded over wrestling. So it was one of those things where it's like, oh, um, we have uh, tickets. We have extra tickets for military uniforms. So if you guys want to go see wrestling tonight, you go. And me and him were like, oh, you people raise our hands. <laughs> raise, all, raise everything. So we got to go and like hang out. <laughs> yeah, we got to like hang out and stuff. So it was really cool. A couple months later, we ended up deploying together too. So we share our love of wrestling, things like that. And I remember one day in particular, we were just like sitting around and we were trying to talk about like what we were going to do like after this, what was going to be like our next steps. I said, I was like, all right, I am going to try to be a wrestler. I'll do like some research. Da, 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 da. And he's like, yeah, that's cool. I might, you know, stay in, da, 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 things like that. So I got out and I started training to be a wrestler. He stayed in and he got his promoter's license in D.C. Hmm. So, yeah, he actually founded Fight Club in D.C. So the pan Ass title was kind of like something that we were talking about, like in 2012. Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? Is there going to be a place that's like going to let us be, you know, how we want to be? You know what I mean? Is there a place where like a bunch of us and all our friends can get together and have something kind of cool just for us. Like, will that exist? And it does because, you know, he made a point to make it so. And that's how the Pan-African title came to be. That's how Fight Club came to be. It, it was an idea one day, a conversation so long ago. We talk about that so often. I was like, yo, this was such a conversation randomly one day. And it just 
became this. And it's so cool to be able to, to represent that. I think it represents our friendship. It represents camaraderie. It represents a place for me and all my friends. We can go and there is some place. Like if you thought there was no place in all of wrestling, you thought there was no place. Can't, you can't go anywhere. There is one place and it's like, it's a place for you. It's a place for me. We can go and express our art in a way that makes us all feel good and feel seen too. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's, <laughs> that's, well, that's, that's quite club and that's the pan af title. And that's a celebration of our culture. That's true Afro, Afro punk essence. God, I love it. So I don't know how we haven't gone over this because we've kind of like touched on, you know, army and then heading into wrestling, but like what was, where did your love for wrestling actually start? Because if you're meeting people in the army that you're getting deployed with and you're talking about wrestling, like clearly you were watching wrestling at one point or another. So what happened? How'd you get into it? Oh my gosh. I've been watching wrestling since I, since I can open my eyes. So I have uh, five brothers. I'm the only girl. So oh, yeah. it was a wrestling household. Oh my gosh. My dad watched wrestling. My mom watched wrestling. Everybody watched wrestling. So Monday night and Thursday night, we were just <laughs> fighting over the remote channel surf and it was crazy. So that's where the love started. And I'll tell you what, too, like, I don't know, I would watch wrestling and I would always see it as a thing that I was watching on TV. This is a thing that other people are doing. How cool, what a spectacle. One day I saw Jacqueline and everything changed. I was like, oh, it never crossed my mind one time that I could be a part of the spectacle, too. You know, that I could be a part of the show and just seeing her be so strong and still be so beautiful and still, she was very tough. You can see it in like, it was, it was just like threaded in her. It was so cool. The coolest thing I had ever seen. And like seeing her made me go, oh shoot, this is cool. I think I can do this too. You know, seeing her and jazz growing up. I'm like, yeah, this is, this is so cool. So I've always carried that love. That's why representation is so important to me because like seeing them change something in me. And I'm like, oh, now I know what's possible. If, if I thought nothing, I thought I couldn't do anything. I saw that and something just shifted. And I was like, that is so cool. And, you know, I'm hoping I could do that, you know, for people too, that they, that they see me and something shifts and they go, oh, this is something new that I never thought could be. And how cool is that? You know what I mean? So. Well, uh, that begs the question then, because uh, knowing that Jacqueline and Jazz were big inspirations to you, you actually got to wrestle Jazz a couple of summers ago. Tell me about how that experience felt coming full circle and, and getting to do that. Yes, me and uh, Jazz tagged together for her last year. So um, she was going on a bit of a retirement tour before she went on to full-time train. Initially, we were supposed to wrestle each other, but as things kind of like winded down physically, you know, we just went ahead and tagged together. Got to put the hurt on some people. It was so cool. I'm in the ring and she is cheering me on right there. And I'm like, like, is it cheering me on? Like, it's, it was, it was so cool. It was so cool. We got to like take pictures afterwards. I got to like chit chat with her and it was such an awesome moment. And I really do think that like the child in me needed that. That felt like just a warm hug, being able to like just have that moment with her. And I thought that was that was so cool. I, I made sure to over tell her how cool I thought she was growing up. It's probably sick of me hearing it in that conversation, but I made a point to tell her and it, it felt nice to be able to have that moment and be able to say that. So. It's one of those full circle moments of like, oh my God, I used to watch this person on TV and now they're like cheering me on as I'm taking heat about to like come in for a hot tag, right? Just the world that you kind of, when you when you close that circle, it's just wild the way that that can happen. Is there anything that like you learned from her while you were tagging? Yes. She made a point to let me know that it is very important that I speak up for them. Mm. That was like, that was one of the first things it was one of those things where it's like, hey, you know, if you don't, if you don't remember anything, remember that you always have to stand up for yourself and you, you know, what's right and you know, what feels good and you know how you want to perform your art and you have to stand up for what you believe in. And I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, my head could have exploded at that point. Like, I was just like, that is, and, and it's always what I need to hear, you know? Whatever I needed to hear, I bet you she'd have just had it, you know? And it's just that connection that we have. And I just, I heard exactly what I needed to hear. I'm exactly the person I needed to hear. 
is so cool. Wrapping up here, you are now one of the mainstays, one of the fixtures of Ring of Honor. I think when we look at, you talked earlier about how the women's division in Ring of Honor is really thriving. We just introduced a second championship and what you've gotten to bring to the table so far. Um, but that's the thing. We haven't really gotten to talk about what you've so far felt like you've brought to the table in Ring of Honor, in this current rendition of Ring of Honor, and what some of your goals are and what do you hope to take away from Ring of Honor when it's all said and done for you? Yes. For me, my power is in the handshake, honestly, just being a part of something so honorable. I love technical wrestling. I think it belongs on the main stage. It's something that has, it's helped smarten me up as a human being, I feel like. I feel like, especially since like honing in these past like two years, in my head, I always want that to be at the forefront of everything that I'm doing. I'm absolutely going to be the most honorable competitor I'm going to shake your hand before and after a win or loss. There's nothing that can truly shake how I feel about myself as a performer. That is the confidence that I have. And that is what I try to put forth every single week. Every single week, you're going to get an honest competitor out of me. And I absolutely will take you to your limit every chance that I get. You can count on that. You can shake on that. Hell yeah. Oh, I, I don't know if we can like go any further than that. That was just so powerful. I'm like, oh, all right, mic drop, we're done. There we go. Thanks, everyone. This is unrestricted. <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, Trish, this was just such an awesome conversation today. Like, I'm going to hang out around you because clearly when you're around, good things happen. <laughs> good pathways open and excellence emerges. And it's just so freaking cool to see like how your story has changed over time and to see the growth of you as a performer and as a woman and it's just it's so great i'm so happy i get a chance to work with you and i'm so happy you got to have a chance to talk with us today yes i really really appreciate you all for showcasing me on this platform i appreciate your time i know you all are very hard working and there's always something 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 to do and you took time out to do this with me and i think that's so neat so thank you guys. Hell yes. Uh, you can listen to episodes of Unrestricted, new episodes every Thursday on all of your favorite podcast platforms, video episodes on our YouTube channel, AEW Podcasts. You can watch Dynamite on Wednesdays on TBS. You can watch Rampage on TNT on Fridays. You can watch Collision on Saturdays on TNT. And of course, watch ROH. Definitely watch some Ring of Honor where you can see this chick kick ass every single week. Thursdays on Honor Club. I am Aubrey Edwards, along with my co-host, Will Washington. Thank you so much for listening to AEW Unrestricted. Come on, throw your hands up, let me see you. Unrestricted, got the house now. We gon' turn it up, up, bring the house down. Got that big space pumping, make them bounce now. Blouse it like they bouncing.